So welcome to the Doctor's Pharmacy. I'm Dr. Mark Hyman, and I'm really excited today to have an extraordinary guest, Michael Moss, a reporter for the New York Times, who's really had an extraordinary career. He's a Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist. He wrote a book, which I love, called Salt, Sugar, and Fat, How the Food Giants Hooked Us. It was a number one New York Times bestseller published in 2013. Amazing book. Everybody should get a copy. He's really working on another book, which I'm excited to read, which we don't know when it's coming out yet, but it's called Hooked, Food and Free Will which is an important topic because if we are hooked and addicted to food, it's hard to have free will. When food's addictive, personal responsibility, I think, is a fiction. From 2000 to 2015, he was an investigative reporter with the New York Times, mostly reporting on the processed food industry. And in 2010, he won the Pulitzer Prize for explanatory reporting on his investigation on the dangers of contaminated meat. His hamburger article was the centerpiece of a body of work focused on surprising and troubling holes in the food system to keep food safe. Before joining the Times, Mr. Moss was a reporter for the Wall Street Journal, the New York Newsday, and the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. And he was finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in 2006 for his reporting on the lack of protective armor for soldiers in Iraq and in 1999 for a team effort on Wall Street's emerging influence on the nursing home industry. He received an Overseas Press Club citation in 2007 for stories on the faulty justice system for the American-held detainees in Iraq. Mr. Moss has been an adjunct professor at Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism. In 1983, he covered an expedition up the west ridge of Mount Everest in Nepal. I always wanted to do that. I'm really sad I didn't get to go. Uh, he was born in Eureka, California. He went to San Francisco State, and he lives in Brooklyn with his wife, Eve, a writer, and their two boys. Welcome, Mr. Michael Moss. Thank you so much. Now, I first want to ask you, you know, you went from flak jackets and imperfect armor to food. So how did you switch from military to food? It was a bit of an accident, actually. 2008, I was in Algeria reporting on anti-government militants there when a couple of FBI agents showed up at the New York Times headquarters where I was working looking for me. <laughs> I wasn't there, of course, but they explained to my editors that somehow having reported on the war in Iraq and having tortured the Pentagon for failing to equip um, U.S. And, and Iraqi soldiers with the simplest body armor yeah. and having written about militants in Morocco and, and Syria and Lebanon, I had landed on an al-Qaeda hit list. Uh -oh. True or not, <laughs> I think it may have been just the Algerian government trying to get rid of me. I was asked to get on the next plane and come home, which I only sort of mentioned because I went from one war to another because while I was coming home, my editor at the time spotted an outbreak of salmonella in peanuts being processed in southern Georgia, the state southern Georgia, yeah. and suggested to me that I might go down there and have a look at that. And I kind of balked a little bit because like, I think I was hatching up a story about U.S. arms sales overseas. I'm an investigative and journalist. And you had to go with peanuts, like, really? And she goes, you know, <laughs> she goes in, in her way, being a very, very smart editor, you know, look, Michael, think about it here, right? So these are peanuts, for starters, healthy things that parents are giving to their little kitties. And those little kitties are coming up, you know, ill. And some people, in fact, are dying. In fact, thousands of people were dying across the, I'm sorry, were getting ill across the country. Um, these are being processed here in the good old US of A, we can't blame China for this one. And they're being used by this $1 trillion processed food industry about which we really know very little. Mm -hmm. These are the base notes you look for when you're doing investigative journalism. And I went down and did the first story and was sort of off and running in opening up this incredible industry. You started with peanuts and then you ended up in a food fight. <laughs> well, I started with peanuts and then I moved on to sort of meat, the contaminated meat story. And, and both those stories were about the industry kind of losing control over its food chain, mm -hmm. over the quality the, mm -hmm. of, of its products. But I was having dinner one night with one of my best sources who tests meat for E. coli for the food industry. And he goes, mm. look, Michael, you know, as tragic as these incidents are, you really should look at some of the things that my industry, and he was speaking about the, food, the, the meat industry, is intentionally adding right. to its products, over which it has absolute control. 
he was mostly concerned about the huge amounts of salt going into processed meat. When I looked at salt, though, I also realized that sugar uh, was a huge, a huge powerful ingredient to the industry and then, and then fat as well as sort of this unholy trinity in which the processed food industry relies on to make its products, you know, really cheap, really convenient and irresistible. Yeah, well, that, that sort of brings me to this, this story that was in your book, Salt, Sugar and Fat, where it kind of was a wake up call for me when I read it. Most of us say, well, the food industry wasn't really intentional about their actions in creating food that was addictive or trying to take over the food supply. They just were trying to promote and sell their products, which they thought were fine. But it turns out in the 50s, there was a meeting, which probably would be a collusion now around (laughs) antitrust, if you knew about it, of General Mills convening all these food giants in Minneapolis, which was the grain capital of the world, and saying, how do we prevent the overtaking of the food system by these do-gooders who are trying to get people to eat real food back then. There was a woman named Betty you talked about in your book who was a home ec teacher who actually was passionate about getting families to learn how to cook and eat real food. Yeah, so it's actually and, a little more. It was a little more recent than me. It was actually 1999, which is really oh, I significant. I thought it was in the 50s. Yeah, the no, convenience the convenience thing. Yeah, no, no, no. It's it's it was. The, I think the meeting you're referring to was 1999. Um, at the Pillsbury headquarters, the old Pillsbury headquarters mm-hmm. in Minneapolis, Minnesota. But the fascinating thing about it is that it was it was convened by a cabal of insiders in the largest food manufacturers in North America who were becoming alarmed about their growing culpability mm-hmm. um, in not just obesity, diabetes, but they felt their products were were rightfully so being linked to several types of cancers. And they brought the heads of the biggest companies together secretly to talk about how they were going to deal with this problem from a corporate standpoint. And 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 in fact, this cabal of insiders were pleading with the company's officials to do something to turn the corner on behalf of consumers, make their products more healthier, cut back on the marketing of the junkier stuff. And you can probably imagine what happened. Yeah, there were a few people with a moral compass, but... It didn't really yeah, work out that I way. Mean, the biggest the response stuff. came from the then CEO of General Mills. He said, look, I mean, we uh, we make a low salt version of our products, put on the shelf if people want that. We're adding whole grains to some of our cereals. Um, we are be you know we are sensitive to consumers and to health, but you have to realize that we are also beholden to shareholders, and there is no way we're going to mess around with the company jewels. He said, mm-hmm. referring to salt, sugar, fat. If that's going to diminish the appeal of our products, and yeah. by and large, that's the position of the food industry um, going forward, even today. And you these sh- are companies. And you shared how they tried to manipulate their products to have less of these ingredients, and you tried to eat them, and they were horrible tasting, right? Yeah, you couldn't uh, even uh, eat them, right? Yeah, so <laughs> at, at one point, I, you know, I went to them and said, look, let's just, let's just take salt for a minute, <laughs> right? Which seems to be like public enemy number one now because of its, its links, to, links to, to heart disease, high, high blood pressure. What... Everybody wants you to cut back on salt. Why can't you do it? And this was mm. this was a beautiful moment for me when I really realized there was a rich story to tell here because mm-hmm. Kellogg's invited me in uh, to Battle Creek, uh, Michigan, into oh. its secret research and development laboratory where they put these foods together. Um, but they did something really cool. They prepared for me versions of their products without any salt in them at all to show me why they were struggling so much yeah. to reduce the salt. <laughs> and and I have to tell you, it was one of the most god-awful dining experiences in my life because we started with the Cheez-Its, which, yes. unlike you, I could normally you love eat those. day in and day out, right? <laughs> the ones without salt, right? But they stuck to the roof of our mouth. We couldn't swallow them because salt provides texture and solubility. Um, we moved on to the frozen waffles, put them yes. in the toaster, they came out looking and tasting like straw because yeah. because salt adds color and taste and the funnest part were the were the cornflakes put them in the bowl added some milk took a bite and before i could say anything the chief spokeswoman for the company is sitting there next to me and she goes she gets this look of horror on her face and she swallows and she blurts out the word me- metal i taste metal m e t a l 
And I'm thinking to myself, yeah, I, I thought one of my fillings came out of my mouth and was wow. like sloshing around. <laughs> and also with us at the table is the chief technical officer who's in charge of all things scientific at the company. He starts chuckling and he goes, not everybody will taste that, but one of the, one of the beautiful things about salt for us is that it will mask, cover up some of the off notes, they call them, or bad taste that are inherent to many processed yeah. foods. And so all of those things make salt to the industry more than just flavor, which you're adding when you're cooking yourself. And salt's a great thing there. But it's, but it's doing all these things that makes the, makes the products um, sort of the industrial powerhouses that they are. And the truth is, when you take these processed ingredients that are highly refined, they taste awful. And the only way to make them taste good is to put in salt, sugar, and fat. And what was fascinating to me, Michael, was that you talked about the science behind the salt crystals and how they apply them and the different shapes of them and what they do and how they affect taste and the tongue and stimulation. This is not just, oh, let's throw some salt on. This is highly scientific processes that they use to actually hook us. Yeah, and it, it, it is extraordinary science that they use. And it's, it's, it's not, I mean, it's, it's, it's a very real thing. And in fact, since you... <laughs> Since you want to talk I'm about salt, that. he's pulling out a bag I of have potato chips. For I'm not you. Even well, these are Uts. My wife is from Baltimore, so this is actually a family wow. uh, favorite, even though it's actually made in, in Pennsylvania. So, the thing about the potato chip is that it kind of illustrates salt, sugar, and fat. Um, the salt they call the flavor burst, and indeed, it comes in some. 40 different versions uh, with different additives and packaging size and all of that, each one kind of designed for a special purpose. The cool thing about salt on a potato chip is that it's typically on the outside of the potato chip, or at least that's the first thing that touches the saliva, which I'm licking right now, <laughs> um, which, which of course goes into your taste buds and sends that signal to the reward center of your brain which um, which sends that feeling of pleasure back, saying, "Michael, I love that. Keep doing it." Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> mm, excuse me so much. <laughs> By the way, that noise we can talk about the noise that the potato chips makes too. But the other thing about noise uh, about chips is that they are, uh, of course, loaded with. Fat. The industry calls fat the mouthfeel, and there mm. is a very precise formula that they want to hit in making snack foods, and it's basically 50%. 50% of the calories should come from fat because that will allow those products to melt in your mouth. This is not But the taste. fat they use is not good fat. They use refined oils well, there and you processed go. fats and often there trans fats. Go. These are very bad for you. Yes, but still a powerful weapon in the hands of the, of the industry in terms of getting you to eat more than you otherwise would. Um, and again, fat is a sensation that your trigeminal nerve picks up, also goes to the same part of your brain that sends back that feeling of, of pleasure. Um, but what I didn't know, and, and you did, I'm sure, until I spent some time with these scientists developing these products, which is... Potato chips are also loaded with sugar. Yeah. In the form of the simple potato starch, right. which gets converted into sugar. You know, and sugar in your body. And so you've got um, which by the way, they call the bliss point when they yes. hit that perfect amount of sugar. Um, so the so the potato chips have all three things going for them. It's it's a it's a great example. It's unbelievable. And it's these aren't foods. They're science projects masquerading as food, essentially. They and, like to refer to them as engineering projects and, and their invention of these products as engineering. And, and one of the things you did, part of your research for the book, is you went and looked at MRI scans, functional MRIs, looking at brain patterning that happens as a result of eating these foods in the areas in the brain that are stimulated that drive addictive behavior. Can you just talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, so so the whole sort of area of brain science and studying the brain to sort of kind of figure out what's going on inside us when we do eat these products. I mean, obviously, it's a very young science. You have to take you have to take much of it with a grain of salt. Uh, uh, um, I think somebody at Harvard said recently that if really understanding the brain is a mile long journey, we've come about three inches so right. far. Um, but they are able to, um, you know, slide people into the MRI and either show them pictures of food, which is a very cool thing because that sort of measures the wanting or the mm -hmm. desire of those foods. And then if it's something that you can easily kind of suck on and digest like chocolate, for example, then they can also record um, the, the, 
the pleasure part of the of the system. And I'll, I'll tell you a funny story on that. I I was doing a, I was doing an interview recently with somebody who's doing these kinds of research, and, and he, <clears throat> they have a system where they can put milkshake into your mouth to measure and then show you pictures of that to measure both the wanting and the desire once the milkshake actually drips on your tongue because you know you can't move your head in the MRI um and um you know I said to him before look I mean I'm not a huge milkshake drinker but if we put some like Pinot Noir in the <laughs> little tubing system and drip that in, I think you're going to really see some reward, you know, signals going off yeah. in my brain. It's, it's pretty interesting. You know, we think that it may be, you know, the mouthfeel, the stimulation of the tongue, the taste buds, the pleasure that may be affecting that. And you go, okay, well, it's just the design of the food. But we actually know from Dr. David Ludwig's work that people who had identical tasting looking milkshakes with the same calories, same protein, fat, and carbs, and fiber, one had a high glycemic starch, meaning it raised the blood sugar quickly. The other one didn't, had profoundly different effects. The mm -hmm. ones that had the high sugar one, even that they didn't know they were eating something different, stimulated insulin, made their blood sugars higher, their cortisol higher, but also when they looked at the brain imaging, it stimulated the area called nucleus accumbens, which is the area that is the same stimulated area for addiction, like heroin or cocaine. And it really is fascinating that you don't even have to know what you're eating. It's really the, the biology of these foods is right. designed to make you hooked. And that's what your new book's on. Yes, it is. It's sort of looking at that question. Is this stuff, you know, really addictive? Can we can we compare it to drugs or tobacco or an alcohol and kind of in what ways? Um, and, and also kind of going forward, too, is that sort of a, is that how we want to, you know, think about these these foods? Is that sort of a, a good way to kind of wrestle with them as a, as a social policy and a personal health? Yeah, because then, standpoint? you know, personal choice becomes a little bit of a fiction when you have products on the market that are highly addictive. Yeah, absolutely. Right? So I that, mean, yes. And, you know, speaking of that, you know, when I read your book, Salt, Sugar, and Fat, which everybody should get, it's an extraordinary book, It, it, it you talked about the, the sort of intentionality here where they create taste institutes and hire craving experts to create the bliss point of food with the purpose of creating heavy users. These were their own interpret, internal terms. And you talked about Howard Moskowitz, who was a scientist, food scientist, who formulated a new tasting Dr. Pepper and had 61 different varieties that we tested over in 3,000 different taste tests. Yes. And, and they're looking for this magical point you call the bliss point. It was Howard Moskowitz who coined the term the bliss point to apply to that sort of perfect amount of sugar in foods. And it is kind of a precise point on a bell-shaped curve. And anybody who likes sugar in their coffee, for example, can do the test themselves at home. Just just add sugar till you get to the point where you really love the coffee and keep adding sugar and pretty much you'll be going, yuck. Um, the really kind of important thing for me about about that, though, was not that the companies hired people like Howard Moskowitz to engineer foods with the perfect bliss point of sweetness, foods that we know should be sweet and we already consider to be sort of treats like ice cream and soda and cookies. The food companies marched around the grocery store adding sugar to things that weren't Everything. sweet before. Salad dressing. <laughs> <laughs> Salad dressing, yogurt, pasta sauce. Um, creating kind of this expectancy in us that everything should be sweet. So if you've got kids and you're trying to drag them over to the part of the grocery store where we should all be spending more time, the produce aisle, and they get hit with some sour or bitter notes, the other, you know, the other four or five tastes that Aristotle wrote about way back when, you, you know, that's why you have a riot on your hands because they are attuned, they are expecting everything yeah. to be sweet. It's true. I mean, I, one of the surprising facts I uncovered was that your morning low-fat fruit sweetened yogurt, which is considered a health food, has more sugar per ounce than soda, which is startling, you know? You know, I mean, who knew that walking into the grocery store was such a treacherous thing? I mean, you have to be on your guard at all times. And and they will, look, these are companies. I mean, and and I always like to sort of make that point. It's not that I, it's not that I see them as this evil empire that intentionally set out to make us usually overweight or otherwise ill. I mean, these are companies doing what all companies want to do, which is to make as much money as possible by selling as much product as possible. Mm -hmm. And they just happen to have some very smart people working for them to work on the marketing, on the packaging, on the ingredients, everything. But knowing what you know, and them, I think, knowing what they know, which is hard to not know it in 2018, 
Isn't there something nefarious about how they go about, for example, targeting children? I mean, I was with Senator Tom Harkin when he was a senator in charge of health, uh, and he said he saw this little kindergarten preschool class with beautiful chairs all throughout the kindergarten. They were all labeled with Coca-Cola because Coca-Cola donated them, mm. and that they target children to try to get them brand loyal early on. And then they look at their population of users and the ones who were already drinking a lot of soda, they try to get them drinking more, like targeting the ones who drink over a thousand cans a year to drink even more. They must know what they're doing here. Um, one of my favorite characters in the book was Jeffrey Dunn for 20 years, one of the one of the biggest, um, biggest warriors in Coca-Cola. He rose to become president of Coca-Cola for North America, South America. And he walked me through, you know, those very marketing schemes that they use. One I mean, calls, this was after he quit? Is after, well, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he had an epiphany at one point and decided... Couldn't uh, live with himself anymore? Exactly. And um, But one of those strategies is what they call up and down the street marketing, which refers to their trucks, like other snack food companies, driving from corner stores to corner store, which in cities typically surround the schools and get the kids coming and going, and controlling the real estate in those stores. So it's the snack food companies that own the coolers, the racks up front near the cash register, and that's that's where the heavy salt, sugar, fat sort of snacking um, comes from, is they're controlling that, that very important space uh, for kids, especially knowing that when a child goes in for the first time with their, their own spending money, they will become imprinted, brand loyal, and will start making a habit of that. I mean, it seems that, you know, when you look at the science around how they develop these foods, that they're intentionally trying to create foods that hook people. So do you think they are blind to the idea that these are addictive, that they, that they know it but just don't talk about it or hide it? I mean, what's really going on after all these conversations? Do the people in these companies know what they're doing? Well, there was this really interesting moment. So after that 1999 meeting I, 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 t I spoke about earlier, um, Kraft, which at the time was the largest processed food company, these insiders who had organized the meeting from Kraft went back and they actually managed to get Kraft to unilaterally adopt some reforms of their formulation and marketing of their products. And they sort of went after those things. And and one of the one of the hardest things for them was when they went to their food engineers and said, you know, thou shalt no longer simply add as much salt, sugar, fat as you want to these products as you want to. We're going to put caps on them. Mm -hmm. And the food engineers were sort of like a little non I mean, they were like a little baffled, like what's going on here? They spent their entire career in efforts to maximize the allure of their products. And here suddenly they were being asked to do something less than that. I think where they try to draw the line is saying that we never intended to people that people pig out. Clearly, we intended to maximize the allure of our products. And I think that's that's where that's where things got out of control, is where products designed to be irresistible became really irresistible and, and commonplace. And snacking became the fourth American meal, which <laughs> turned their products into, into, in, into something very treacherous for people that, that maybe initially they weren't. Yeah, no, it's it's frightening. And when when you look at the research you did, you've interviewed over 300 food industry experts, scientists, former employees. You sort of did a little muckraking. <laughs> and what was the most surprising thing you found that sort of you went, oh my goodness, I didn't know that. And um, well, a few things. I, I, you know, being an investigative reporter, I, I, of course, am beholden to go after the money, and there was certainly a lot of money to to look at. Um, but I kind of fell in love with the language that they use when they talk to each other about their efforts to maximize the allure of their products. They talk about, for instance, they don't have to use the word addiction. They talk <laughs> about making their products craveable. Um, uh, and the difference snack -a -ball, is? Snackable, <laughs> snackable. And one of my favorites is, you know, designing more ishness into the products. But going back to the extraordinary. And they talk about stomach share. And stomach share. Right? Well, here, we can talk about stomach share right here. So I've also brought for you a very 
orange and blue giant bag. Well, giant bag, this may be one serving for some people, which I'll open up right now to illustrate one of the other kind of language things that really got my attention. They realized that, and I'm going to do this since you didn't volunteer. No, I will not, I will not eat that orange colored thing that's neon. So this I don't orange neon colored food. thing about the no size food. of my index finger here, very puffy looking, is gonna go into my mouth. And when I press it against the roof of my mouth, it will melt because of that 50% formula I mentioned before and disappear. And what the industry realized is that the signal to the brain when that disappears is that the calories have disappeared as well, right? So that you're part. eating air. So you <laughs> might, you're eating air, Michael. You might as well finish this whole giant bag if you don't mind. Um, and they call that phenomena the vanishing caloric density. Wow. It's a fabulous term that in so many ways kind of illustrates their their drive to use extraordinary science to make their products. And you just keep wanting more and more and more. And you know, you know I mean, and, and I mean it's yeah. easy to binge on a whole bag of Cheetos, but you're not gonna eat ten avocados, right? And <laughs> you know, and Margaret, you know, and they know that. And that was one of the more gripping things to me. So that they were other surprising about. thing is that they don't eat their own products, yes. especially when they get into health trouble. Um, a former uh, chief technical officer of Kraft used to jog for for keeping his, his health and weight in check. And at one point, he blew out his knee and couldn't run anymore. And the very first thing he did was stopped eating some of his favorite products in the grocery store, yeah. knowing that he was one of those people who could open up a bag of chips and have to eat the whole thing when he came home mm -hmm. after, after work. He could not um, eat just a handful of chips. And so they themselves know how powerful their products are for, for many of us. And what I find it fascinating is that th they have the capacity to reformulate their products that are somewhat healthier. Right? Yes. And, and in, a friend of mine, Vani Hari, called The Food Babe, found out that Kraft in the UK was not allowed to have any artificial colors or chemicals or additives. Right. And so they produce products out there. They're free of those yes. but in the united states they didn't and she forced them almost unilaterally under a lot of peer pressure and social pressure and social media pressure to have them change their formulation right um there are different levels of salt sugar fat that they add to their products in different countries in the world depending on sort of habits that people then you know and i think that also kind of speaks to speaks to kind of the the the, the phenomena that the companies they are responsive to public concern, it's just that their ability now to play a significant role going forward as more and more people are caring about what putting in their bodies is is really pretty suspect because again, these are miracle ingredients that they're using. They can dial back a certain to a certain extent, but at some point their products just kind of fall off a cliff and, yeah. and they're, they're, they're not tasting very good. Um, and you, your book made a huge splash when it came out and I think raised a lot of eyebrows and certainly got my attention and many others. How has the food industry's behavior or actions shifted as a result of the story coming out? So less the food industry behavior than our own behavior. And again, more and more people have become concerned about what they're eating. And that concern has started to translate into purchase decisions in the grocery store. And it didn't take much to send the industry into a panic. So there was another meeting just a couple of years ago, Florida, um, with investors. And one after another of the large companies stood up and reported dismal profit mm -hmm. earnings. And the more forthright of, on, of them um, confessed that they were losing Losing stomach share, fa oh, stomach <laughs> share, but also the trust of their consumers. Yeah, and that's really so. Where you started to see this new trend now of everybody cutting back on, especially on salt, sugar, fat, but other things like artificial colorings, etc. In the, you know, in sort of this desperate gamble to to try to win back the the trust of consumers. And I, you know, and I think I've really mixed feelings about it. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting because you have to look at this from a bigger perspective. If you look at the foods consumed by Americans, 60% of them come from commodity foods, wheat, corn, and soy yeah. in the form of flour, high fructose corn syrup, and soybean oil, refined soybean oil, which is often the fat that's in your right. mouthfeel right. thing. Right. And those people who consume the most of those are the sickest 
And no matter how they dial up or down the ingredients or tweak their products, it's still junk, right? So this, this is an interesting phenomenon where as people become more aware, how, do, how are they responding to that? Well, the companies, I mean, people or, or the companies? People and, and companies, both. I, 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 you know, I, I think we're all having to get smarter. I mean, even looking at the nutrition facts label on some of these products, I have sort of mixed feelings. About fake, because, news. Because, <laughs> well, yeah, fake news. Because, well, yeah, well, yeah, because <laughs> they're very good at adjusting these numbers yeah. to whatever is the immediate concern of people buying right. it. And, and in the past, it's sort of been sugar and, and salt and then some kinds of fat and calories and fiber. And so... So you look at this, you go, okay, that seems kind of reasonable, but then you realize it's still junk. junk right. right. Jun it's a little less junky, food. but it's still junk. <laughs> so, so, I mean, it's better than nothing. At least we now know what's going in these products, especially because of the, the, the requirement that they list the ingredients. Um, but, 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 but I think it's incumbent upon us, and this is easier for some people than others, to think more about sort of what we're eating and 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 is this real food and how can we how can we make adjustments in in our life to to get better food uh, for ourselves and our families? Yeah, it's pretty interesting what's happening because in this country, as you mentioned, sales are going down. I mean, I think there's a 25 percent reduction in soda consumption mm. in the United States, mm. but globally it's increasing. So where they can't sell to us, they're basically selling to the rest of the world and particularly developing countries. We have 80% now of the world's type two diabetics in the yep. developing world. Yep. And we're seeing massive obesity across the globe. Yep. And there are countries that are starting to sort of stand up against this. For example, Chile right. recently came up with a series of different policy recommendations that I thought were pretty profound because the doctor, uh, the person who runs the country, Michelle Bachelet, is a pediatrician mm. and the vice president of the Senate is a doctor mm. and they, put in policies of 18% soda tax. They eliminated any food marketing to kids. In fact, they they banned Tony the Tiger mm. and all the cartoon characters on food products for kids. And they even put warning labels like on cigarettes on the front of the packaging in the box. They eliminated any uh, advertising in radio, TV, or movie theaters. They eliminated advertising for formula because they want people to breastfeed. Mm. They cleaned up all the schools. Mm. It's profound. And the food companies went crazy and they're actually suing the government. Mm. But is this the kind of thing that's going to shift things globally? Yeah, I mean, it's it's got to be usually upsetting to the food companies because they did what the tobacco industry did, which is as concern increased in this country, they began shifting their marketing overseas. And that was their, you know, that was their 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 biggest hope for sales. So they've got to be really scared of those initiatives. And it's sort of ironic too that people in those countries are doing things that we've not been able to do in, in this no. country. I mean there's a lot of bravery. I, I you know I read an article about Colombia where the food industry there was going after activists, food activists who mm. were advertising for a soda tax mm -hmm. in Colombia. Mm -hmm. And then there were, there were thugs threatening them. They, they mm. hacked into their computers and their phones. They made it illegal to talk about a soda tax in Colombia. This is really kind of fascist behavior. Well, now you're back to the, the fundamental you know issue here, which is the huge amount of money being made by these companies. Yeah. I mean, isn't it the biggest global industry? I think it's $18 trillion globally because 9 billion people eat. Yes. If you throw everything, everything into it, you all might the whole food chain, yeah, the whole food system. Let's talk about labels mm. because you were mentioning the food label. And, yeah. you know, in this country, you kind of have to have a PhD in nutrition to understand the nutrition facts label. I think it's called, it should be called alternative facts or fake news because it's so risk representative of what really matters. Mm. And in other countries, they're implementing things like the stoplight version, which is green, this is good for you, yellow, mm. eat with caution, red, mm -hmm. this is going to kill you. Mm -hmm. Or they put front of label packaging on, or they, mm -hmm. they actually have it much more sensible. Mm -hmm. In this country, it's almost impossible unless you have a PhD to understand that. And even then it's hard. The first thing to realize is that the, the front of the package is the most valuable real estate. And that's where the companies put their best foot forward. And so, for example, these wonderful <laughs> potato chips, ripples, original, these great words, but you also notice at the top- Gluten-free. Gluten-free. <laughs> now they might have put, you know, on their reduced salt or reduced fat or, yeah. or added vitamins or minerals. That's typically what you'll get. Um, one of the, and, and if people do turn the package over and look at the fine print, one of the deceptive things that goes on there is that, you know, this package of chips, for example, 
is something that um, somebody might eat the whole thing. In fact, a good number of us will sit down well, and it eat says this eight entire bag of chips. Or something. Well, <laughs> right, but all the numbers in here, if you're concerned about um, trans fats, you're concerned about cholesterol or sodium or, or, uh, or fiber, maybe on the positive side, that's another story, protein, um, the overall calories, is per serving, and there's three of those. So you have to yeah. kind of do the math yourself and realize yeah. that's not. Um, well, I asked the, the former head of the FDA, Food and Drug Administration, I said, why can't you make the labels better? Why can't you actually make them make sense and clear? He says, well, when we try to change them, we get enormous pressure from Congress, who's mm. getting enormous pressure from the food industry, sure. and they threaten to shut us down in terms of our funding, which I thought was you know, very revealing. So we have money in politics that's driving policies that are making us sick and fat, and the government's not protecting us. Yeah, and some, you know, in, in, in many ways, the, the food companies are more powerful than the regulators who are there supposedly to regulate They're often the them same people, of right? Often, often the, the same revolving people. door of people there, from industry there, to there government. There is that, and often with, um, with dueling missions, the Department of Agriculture being the best example. I mean, one of its missions is to promote American companies American products here and overseas as commodities, etc. And then a teeny tiny fraction of 1% of their budget goes toward promoting better eating, better nutrition, better health for us. And, and, and the department, you know, you can imagine who sort of wins when push comes to shove. And there's so, and there's so many conflicting policies out there you know that the government really uh, one of the greatest stories in your book was about cheese yes so we were like everybody get off fat low fat low saturated fat so the government's pushing this message out there at the same time that they're aggressively promoting the overuse of cheese because when you take the fat out of dairy yes you're left with some fat to do something with you turn into cheese and yet so they're pushing it on the one hand there it's just a complete contradictory mess if, you know, if only cows had made non-fat milk, which they didn't. So the <laughs> fat from the milk was a commodity. They weren't about to throw it away, and they could only slough so much of it off on other countries in the world. So they made cheese and, and turned cheese from this kind of delightful, tasty treat, you know, in and of itself, or cheese sandwiches, into an ingredient to kind of increase the mouthfeel. And so suddenly you saw processed cheese made overnight in their factories going into everything in the grocery stores seemingly as, as a way. And if I, I did the rough math and basically all of the fat that people took out of their diet from drinking low or non-fat milk snuck back in as a result of these government overseen programs to increase the consumption of, of processed cheese as a way of helping the, the dairy industry. And they're, they're in cahoots with the dairy industry. So the National Dairy Promotion Research Board works with the Dairy Council. So the government works with the Dairy Council to promote it. They had these got milk ads, which actually had to be taken off the air because they were not based in science and they're making health claims that the FTC said were illegal. So this is really where the government gets in hands dirty in a way that is really in bed with industry. With maybe in some sense sort of a noble a, a noble thought in the beginning. Look, no, I mean, we, it's hard not to be empathetic with, with dairy farmers. Um, but the fact was they were overproducing. And, um, and instead of taking that overproduction and like throwing it away or something, in fact, what they were doing was storing it, all that cheese in caves and realized the cheese was going moldy and they had to start like pumping it out into school food programs or et cetera. Um, you know, that's what they did. They sort of, that was their solution was to promote you know, more consumption. And often it wasn't great cheese, right? It was processed cheese. In fact, I love the story about Kraft. We call it American cheese, but it's actually not allowed to be called cheese because yes. it's not 51% cheese. Yeah. It's called Kraft <laughs> slices. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, there's all kinds of euphemisms that they have to use um, because of the standards and, and some of the fit. My what is favorite. the other 49% <laughs> on 50%? Right, 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 right. <laughs> but, but some of the, in fact, some of the cheese engineers at Kraft, you know, were were you know in meeting them and tasting cheese are just kind of appalled at um, at American processed cheese, which to them is you know was not real cheese. It's not like your heirloom goat cheese from France or something like that. No, but but again, it's it's it serves this incredibly powerful role in processed food of sort of that providing that mouthfeel texture allure. And it's in everything. It's just unbelievable. Yeah, I was like, pretty surprised how many it's things like of it. Everywhere you go, restaurants, fast food places, it's 
you, you know, I have to say, please don't put the cheese on, you know. And that was by design, by yeah. marketing plans overseen by the federal government. And then they made it easy, right? They grated it, they shredded it, they have all these pre-packaged processed cheese to so make it super easy to add to everything. Cheap, easy, yummy. Yeah. Those are the, that, that is the unholy trinity of the... Of the, well, of the let, industry. Let's take a different direction for a minute. Um, I recently gave a talk at Riverside Church about the way in which the food industry targets poor and minorities. And mm. we know that, for example, that African American kids drink almost twice as much soda. Mm. We know that they target these communities through advertising. You see, you know, sports stars, athletes, you see stealth marketing really targeted these communities. What did you find in terms of their practices around the poor minorities in, in the book? I mean, I got the sense that they were colorblind. Or rather, I never I never got any hard evidence that they were targeting those kids because of their race. They're going after potential consumers. And by and large, um, you know, kids in the inner city have less choice about where to shop and they're going to be more exposed to the kind of marketing schemes that the companies use, especially those sort of corner stores, which is huge for that. So that was the sense that I got is that they they were going after kids because they were vulnerable because they're kids and they they have they don't have farmers markets. They they don't have access to full scope, you know, supermarkets. Uh, they don't have money. And uh, how do they to, target the heavy users? Because these communities often are using more because they're targeted in some way. How do they go after and try to create heavy users who are using even more to go from 1,000 um, cans to 2,000 cans a day? Yeah, but I mean, con- well, so, right. So there's the 80-20 rule, which is that 20% of your customers will, a certain 20% of your customers will drink 80% of the, of the product. Um, you focus your marketing, your advertising, your promotions, your displays your up and down the street sort of placement of stuff on those very people. Mm, yeah. And it's frightening. In a place like Mexico, water costs three times as much as Coke. It's just amazing, right? <laughs> and of- 20% of their calories came from Coke. And the president of Mexico was formerly the president of Coke for all of Latin America. <laughs> The kind of ownership, increasing ownership of the food companies, including Nestle, of water, um, I think is a is, is a potentially very disturbing thing. Yeah, let's talk about that because I think most people don't know about that. But in order to produce products, these drinks, which are the are the bulwark of these companies' profits, right. they have to have water resources. And how is that affecting fundamental ingredients? How is sure. that affecting you know the the global water supply? I actually don't know the answer to that because I haven't I haven't done that reporting yet. Um, and in fact, uh, precious little reporting has been done on sort of who is like how much of that ownership is sort of shifted hands from us the public the government into the hands of private companies and what does that mean extraordinary so what is the the cost to society to humans from this massive effort by the food industry to get us to become addicted or hooked to their foods i mean i think you can measure it in terms of added medical cost um you can measure it in terms of lost productivity um how else would we measure and those are the we're talking billions and billions of 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 dollars that are you know it's kind of the hidden cost of eating these products that that we're all sort of picking up the burden on i mean the, the 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 healthcare cost i think is the most interesting because because people have been thinking look we were able to impose some very real marketing formulation curbs on the tobacco industry by the states getting together and suing the tobacco companies, not because they were faulting their product to uh, cigarettes, but simply to recover the cost of taking care of people who got sick from smoking. Mm -hmm. And so there's some thought that going after the food companies um, in that same vein, Look, you guys are creating a problem. It's 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 wiping out our healthcare budgets. We're going to ask you to pay for that. So, yeah, um, is a really sort of fascinating way of looking at it. Well, let's talk about that because you know it's interesting to talk about tobacco and food because often they're the same companies. Right, like Philip Morris Kraft. Yes. RJR Nabisco. Right, right, right. right. So they, they changed the names to protect the guilty. But I think that this is the uh, same tactics that are being used. And how do we then, um, 
attack food because tobacco is a very singular product. Right. Whereas you've got soda, you've got Cheetos, you've got all this fast food, processed food. It's more sort of squishy. Yep. How do you go about creating a litigation or even regulation around that? Right. Again, I'm not sure you do. Um, that is one of the, that's that's one of the industries. I, 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 I think a point where they feel really good about their chances in terms of litigation <laughs> is that, you know, you don't, you, there aren't going to be seven processed food company executives sitting up before Congress, you know, saying there's nothing addictive about their products like the tobacco companies. There would be, have to be hundreds because there are tens of thousands of products, you know, in the grocery store. But you know, the, the truth is, Michael, that there's a handful of companies that own all the companies. Like, well, like there's like maybe nine or 10 and they even own all the natural healthy right. brands. But the products are all different. And so who would you single out to... You know, to be the chief defendant in a in a in a legal case, would it be Coca Cola? Would it be Pepsi? Would it be you know Utz potato chips? That's you know, and then how would you prove uh, that their product was responsible for your client's sort of poor health? I mean, I think that's one of the that's one of the difficulties. And the other the other challenge too is that you know, eating a p- a potato chip is not inherently dangerous as smoking a cigarette. Well, um, a potato chip or a cigarette, but it's, it's like right. a bag or a pack becomes yes. more concerning. But then you start getting right. So then you start getting into sort of the marketing and the habit forming strategies of the companies. If you could show that there there was intent to get people to eat not just one potato chip. Um, but the entire bag and bag after bag, then I think you may have some potential for for litigation. But also coming back to sort of the healthcare costs too. Another approach would be to, um, and people have started thinking about this and suggesting it is, is forget about the you know calling them evil or tying them to to bad health. Just go after the the public health care cost and to get them to share that that the burden of the bill and that inherently would 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 re- you know would undermine their marketing. Programs. Right. Well, it's interesting when you wrote once that, that, you know, the CEO of General Mills mm. said to you that maybe we should regulate because we're not going to change our behavior independently. Actually, Mark, that was the head, well, uh, that was a former CEO of, of Philip Morris. Oh, Philip Morris. Yes. Okay. Okay. Even more <laughs> interesting because, um, because no industry hated government regulation more than the tobacco industry. But, mm-hmm. but interestingly, um, and Philip Morris became, as you mentioned, the largest, um, uh, manufacturer of processed food in the in North America through its acquisition of the old company General General Foods out of Terrytown, New York, and then Kraft. Um, and and this Jeff, Jeffrey Bible, this this former CEO, was put in charge of the food industry. So he, he he learned and he studied it, and he met with me and agreed to talk about that. and And he said, Yeah, you know. And I asked him about regulation. He said, You know, look, Michael. I mean, I'm no fan of regulation, as you know, but. Um, you know, this food industry is sort of so kind of out of control in the sense and so vicious in its fighting against one another for space in the grocery store that there may be something valid to sort of getting them together and agreeing upon um, some regulation as a way of kind of defending themselves. I think he sort of, he foresaw what has been happening recently, which is declining sales and the junkiest stuff, and saw their acceptance of regulation as 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 kind of the you know as a as a as a fallback position or something in their own interest to do because something has to happen right this is this is the, the hidden crisis that nobody talks about which is the burden on chronic disease that affects one in two people the fact that Medicare and Medicaid are going to consume a hundred percent of our federal budget in twenty years right. from the burden of chronic disease right. it affects even our military kids are too fat to fight kids right. can't learn in school because they're eating processed food. We see social justice, poverty, even violence being connected to the foods that people are eating. This is a massive global problem. And of course, it even extends beyond that to things like climate change and environment because of how we're growing the food. Right. I think that the companies, to some extent, see their ace in the hole as as being population growth. Um, because they talk about the year, <laughs> More what was it, 2050, when the world is going to have, help me out here, 9 billion people. Yeah. It's probably not the right number. Um, and, you know, and, I think, and I think that gives them the hope that we'll get in the position where 
we will be desperate for calories no matter where they're coming from. Mm -hmm. And these companies that we're now vilifying will ride to our rescue, providing those cheap, easy calories. Um, you know, the long-term healthcare consequences be damned. Um, so they talk about food security. Yeah. Um, and that's what they're referring to is sort of their ability um, and, and that's their argument, is that we're the ones who can feed the world. Well, it's fascinating. If you look at the food system now, 40% of our food is wasted. Mm. And we have more than enough calories on the planet to feed everybody mm. for a long time without mm. increasing food production. And this is sort of the argument of big ag and big food. We need to deal with food insecurity. We need to feed the world. We mm -hmm. need to do these bad things because mm -hmm. there's no other option. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just not true. There are mm -hmm. all kinds of innovations that can happen around this. You know, mm -hmm. I recently uh, got to know the vice chairman of Pepsi, mm -hmm. very interesting guy, doctor. And he said he got asked to speak at the USDA's main meeting. So the agriculture department, which I thought was interesting. Mm -hmm. And he said to them, we need to convene and the government needs to convene all the big food companies and big ad companies to think through these problems together. They mm. can't do it together because that's collusion mm. and that's sort of like antitrust, mm. but they actually could solve these problems together by affecting how we grow the food and agriculture, all the whole food and supply chain could be rethought. And they're trying to think about this, but it's really tough. It's like getting a horse and buggy maker to think about designing a car. And it comes back to their responsibility to shareholders. Um, Pepsi has in the past decade at various times sort of promoted the idea of, of pushing less bad for you products, uh, healthier if you will, um, and has had considerable difficulty with yeah. that because by and large their profit center is still based on the junkier stuff. And yeah. so, it's again. It comes. It comes down to this notion. I'm. You know. I'm kind of still on the fence about their, their ability to play a meaningful role in 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 our lives and making our food system better and 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 for for all of us going moving forward. Because because I think everybody agrees it's unsustainable, right? And yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, so if you were king for a day, and you could change something in the food system or in the world that would make a big difference mm. and you had autonomy maybe king or a, a dictator whatever what would that be you know it's funny you mentioned that i mean I, I don't know if i'd want to be king i'd i'd love to control <laughs> yeah I'd, I'd love to control one zip code because there's about 10 things you'd kind of want to do and i think this is actually really doable yeah. um somebody with some money could actually fund a project where you took a zip code and you started doing, like I said, 10 different things. You, you, you start with the school that's in that zip code and you plant a garden to get kids, not to feed the kids, but to get kids excited about radishes mm -hmm. and strawberries. Mm -hmm. um, then you convince the food delivery companies, right? Home delivery companies to actually deliver to that zip code so they can have access to those products. Or you you build a supermarket in that in that um, in that neighbor in that zip code where once the kid comes home is excited about radishes they can then go with their parents to the store to actually buy those radishes. Mm -hmm. um, you throw in some nudge marketing to sort of help people develop kind of new eating habits. Um, help me out here. There's going to be there's going to be seven other things you could do in that, and then you just kind of do this controlled study. And I think it would be absolutely fabulous to do yeah. that. But I but I think the point in my mind is that teach them how to cook. Teach them. A, yeah. Well. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So I think often we've 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 wished that one thing could solve it, and then like like you know, labeling uh, restaurant calories, you know, putting calories on restaurant menus, you know, in and of itself, it's probably not going to solve anything. But combined with kind of these other, these other things, um, yeah, uh, th that that's probably the way to go. I yeah, you're going to get some synergy going. I on think there. those are great ideas. And I think it's important for us to think about where people live. You know, uh -huh. it turns out that your zip code is a bigger determinant of your health uh -huh. than your genetic code. Not just zip code, but I mean, entire swaths of the country are incredible food deserts. I've given talk, you know, I gave a talk recently in Kansas to the Hospital Association, which was, which was looking for ways to improve the food in hospitals, not just what they serve to patients, but, but in kind of the, you know, in the, in the little store in the hospital for, for patients coming in. Um, and, and one of the, one of the people in the audience explained to me that 
For her, buying food meant driving a hundred miles wow. to one of the big box stores where she could find some produce of certain type, but basically she could only do that run once uh, a week. And that was the limitation. So they're not even talking about farmer's markets yeah, there. Yeah, right, you right. Know, they're talking about just a lack of basic access uh, uh, to fresh vegetables. and, and No, I, 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 really I, I used to live in Idaho in a small town Same. on a Native American reservation. And the grocery, the one grocery store there had a produce section that was about the size of a kitchen table mm, <laughs> mm. with not very happy looking vegetables. Right. And I literally had to drive 50 miles each way to go to the nearest town to go to Costco to try to get some vegetables and I drive, drive them back. I get it. It's hard. And I think that the distribution system, the access is an issue, but also education is an issue. People don't know what they're eating. And I, I think I'm shocked often by the fact that, that many people out there who are struggling with health and weight issues mm. actually don't have the right information about what to do or how to do it. Mm -hmm. And that when they're empowered with that, they often can change. Right. Right. Well, that's what you're doing, of course, yeah. too, which is phenomenal. Yeah. Sort of helping people, you know, getting that information to people about what to do when when they have the opportunity. Yeah, working on a, a new project in the Bronx called Rejuvenation, bringing these skills and ideas to the communities there who suffer the most. Oh, fantastic! Yeah, There's our zip code idea. There you go. We could do it. Yep, it's absolutely got to happen. So. After you learned all this from your 300 interviews and you sort of got in the underbelly of the food industry and the products and what they are, what changed for you about what you eat and what you do and how you live? Well, I have two boys at home. Actually, one just left for college. Oh, Time flies. Congratulations. They, I have to say, were little walking bliss points for sugar, like most kids. Um, but my wife and I kind of decided that we didn't want to be parents who said no, no, no. We wanted to be parents who who could have a conversation with our kids um, and talk to them about industrial, highly processed food, you know, in a political sense, that these are companies trying to their best to to get our kids to do their bidding and sort of think about it in that framework. And I and and we get the sense that 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 looking at it that way is really empowering Dang for the kids. Outraged. So when they were younger, you know, we would go to the cereal aisle and they would realize that the the sweetest uh, brands were at eye level because that's where they're strategically placed oh, yeah. at the at the cereal aisle. And and you know, I would nudge them a little bit to you know look low, or I would reach high for the less sugary things. And 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 could they maybe find a brand that had you know six or five grams of sugar or less per serving? And and you know and they would bring that plain Cheerios home or what have you and 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 yeah I think that they would rather have had the cocoa puffs right yeah. or one of the high sugar ones yeah um uh, but 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 they actually liked the taste of the lower sugar ones more than they would have otherwise having been engaged in a conversation about a food. And I think that's that's where the future, that's where the hope lies is yeah. with young kids, yeah. um, helping them realize that knowing all the tricks that the food companies are up to to get them to do their bidding is empowering and will help them make better decisions yeah. for themselves. Sort of making, making them go up against the oppressors and the injustice of it all, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and as, as it, you know, I, I, I imagine like a new home economics class in school that's designed around that sort of food as politics. And I think even high school kids could really get into them. Yeah, well, l let's talk about that for a minute. I, I, I actually um, once reminded me of a story when I my son was like, there's nothing in the house to eat. Mm -hmm. You know, I said, all right, let's go to the grocery store. I want it for my friends over, but there's never any food here. I said, okay, you can buy anything you want. There's one rule, no trans fat. Aha. Uh -huh. And he couldn't find anything. <laughs> Chips, <laughs> right. pizza, everything had trans fat in it back then. And it was like, it was very educational for him to see. And I, that I said, was eye -opening. anything you want. Um, so, you know, one of the things that um, I think is, is sort of critical for us to think about is how um, these food companies are really pretty deliberate about these practices. And, and people can kind of get to understand what's going on when they realize that. And I, I once went to this family in South Carolina as part of the movie Fed Up mm. where 
they were very overweight. They massive obesity. The father was 42, had kidney failure from diabetes, mm. uh, need a transplant on dialysis. The mother was 200 plus more, maybe 300 pounds. Mm. The son was uh, almost diabetic. Mm. And they lived in a trailer, a family of five on food stamps and disability, one of the worst food deserts in America. Mm. They had 10 times as many fast food and convenience stores as grocery stores. Mm. And rather than sort of you know berate them and said, why don't you eat better? I said, well, let's let's cook a meal together. Mm -hmm. So I, I went grocery shopping, we got simple food. I gave them um, a guide called Good Food on a Tight Budget, which mm -hmm. is how to eat well for you, mm -hmm. for the planet and your wallet. Mm -hmm. And I showed them how to chop vegetables. I showed them how to cook a meal. And before I did that, I went through their cupboards with them. And I said, look, here's a box of your corn dogs. Here's pop tarts. Here's salad dressing. Here's what's in it. Here's these ingredients. Here's what they do to you. Here's why, why they're deceptively not healthy. You know, you, 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 you know, I was sort of look, look at their faces and they were completely shocked. For example, Cool Whip, mm. they thought it was a healthy topping because um. it said zero trans fat on the label. Mm -hmm. Or added vitamins or but something. It, right, but it, but it actually, it, my rule is if it has a health claim on the label, don't eat it. Yeah, right. And it, when you look at the ingredients, it was the primary ingredient on the water was trans fat, mm -hmm. hydrogenated oil, and mm -hmm. high fructose That's corn true. syrup. And the mm -hmm. reason they got away with it was because the FDA allows food companies to say zero trans fat on the front of the packaging right. if it has less than half a gram per serving. Right. That's because of the lobby on the FDA. Mm -hmm. Now, when I showed them all this, they were like, wow, we didn't know this. Mm -hmm. And they were empowered, and they then learned how to cook, and they learned how to eat well. They lost hundreds of pounds. Mm -hmm. The son lost 128 pounds and mm -hmm. is now going to medical school. So it's pretty profound. When you actually empower people with this information, mm -hmm. they'll change. Right. So... Yeah. Yeah, and I think one of the challenges for a lot of people is the next step too, which is how do you how do you stick with it long enough to kind of change your habits? It's a little bit like picking up a new exercise thing, which people typically do in January, and then by March they've kind of given up. <laughs> it, it, it's almost like we're fighting those years and years of ha the habit forming designed and imposed upon us by the companies and trying to change that. So. I think that's one of the other things people have to realize is that once you're hugely overweight, it's really, really hard to change that. You can lose the weight, and then the nightmare can begin in real earnest trying to keep that weight off um, and, until your body and your brain can kind of adjust to kind of the new the new reality, hopefully. So so, so that would be, I mean, that's a great story you're telling, and that's that's fantastic, but, but it's also really, really difficult for people to do. That and also, and I'm really intrigued about your eating guide because, because even for me, one, Wanting, and I do most of the cooking in our house now. So the real challenge is coming up with, with sort of menu, uh, you know, menus that are of interest to people in my family, kind of week in and week out, and kind of keeping that going and not getting in a rut of kind of cooking the same thing, the, the same old <laughs> stuff. Yeah, it's it's that's I think that's a real challenge for people too, and I'm I'm, I'm looking forward to people designing those kinds of, of programs that sort of help you. Yeah, it's powerful. I think we you know. I realized it was really one meal. Cooking one meal with this family made me realize that we're one meal away from changing everything. Mm, you know, like if, yeah. it's not so much about telling people what to do; it's more mm -hmm. like showing them what to do. And that's a great idea. Very powerful. So, after learning all what you learned, uh, you had you had your policy perspective. Right. What would you sort of power consumers to do to make a change around this? Ooh, you know, I, you know, despite my thinking of, of taking a zip code and changing 10 different things, I mean, I really love the idea of changing just one thing because diets fail when they're too radical, too extreme, and you can't stick with them long enough. Um, I mean, I think so. So I love that kind of notion of starting simply with changing one thing in your life, health, diet, what have you. Um, and, and, and that could be, that could be any, you know, that could be anything that is maybe, you know, front and center of your desires. I think for a lot of people, it could be sugary drinks. Yeah. That's a good one. <laughs> I think that's a good one. If you were to sort of single out one of those and you, things I wrote about as being the most problematic one, sugar in, in all of its manifestations, um, you know, you know, could well be the, the most difficult. So, uh, so you brought a Coca-Cola to the podcast. Well, I did bring a Coca-Cola. And I, I don't imagine and that I will, was to offer will, me a this drink. This a nice and bottle <laughs> here. I'm, I'm happy to have you. Uh, and I don't imagine it was for you to drink. Unfortunately, <laughs> it's a bottle and not a can because... Um, 
A, this bottle opener is not working, but um, uh, when you when Let you pop try. open the oh thanks when you pop open a can, ah that that noise the effervescence that it makes is really part of the thank you is really part of the sort of powerful allure of the of the product. Um, I mean, we could talk about Coke for a whole session because. You know, it's it's not just the ingredients in the Coke. It's not just the sugar, but it's the it's the perfect balance of of those ingredients. I discovered having spent time with Jeffrey Dunn, the former president of Coca Cola, explained to me that one of the most powerful things about Coke is that it's 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 imminently forgettable. So you take a sip, like I'm doing right now. Hmm. Brave man. Brave and you're, man. And you're picking <laughs> up some of the various flavor notes that they have in that. But it's not going to linger in the part of your brain that doesn't want you to get too much of one thing, um, which is called sensory specific satiety. Um, rather, it's a perfect kind of blend, and that will have you thinking about this Coke in an hour, even if I drank the whole bottle, in a way that otherwise it, it, it wouldn't. Um, but going back to sort of the one thing, I mean, I think there is some science out there that, again, it's it's early, it's weak, but but it's tempting to sort of look at it because we might not be able to deal with calories in liquids like we deal with calories in solid food. Um, and uh, and if that's true, then cutting out calories in liquids. And everybody knows beer and wine doesn't have calories, so I don't no, have to worry I, about that I stick that with one. tequila because <laughs> beer has got a lot of carbs. <laughs> but but soda and fruit juice, if you're yeah. getting too much fruit juice, and vitamin water. I saw that show up in my house the other day. Yeah. My son was so proud of himself until we looked at the fine print on the label. I think it was 32 grams for yeah. a fairly little bottle. Which is um, almost as much as a Coke. Right. I think if you could, if, if a person says, look, let me just start with that and let me see if I can hook myself on plain water and and fizzy water if you want. Hey, um, uh, uh, that that would be a, like a really fabulous start. That is huge. And I had a uh, someone said I just cut out soda and I lost seventy five pounds. I don't. Yeah, and, and again, and, not and every. That's not going to happen to everybody. But what might happen is you go. I could do that. Maybe I can do this, and you kind of keep going. And again. Weight loss is really difficult when people are really heavy, but but there is, is that potential. But it, but it actually, the science of changing your hormones and your brain chemistry by eating different food mm. is powerful. Mm. So when people do that, they don't crave or want it anymore. Mm. And we know how to do that now. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's amazing studies where they looked at using very, very high fat diets with good fats, right. cutting out all the starch, sugar, and processed food. Right. And you see a 60% reversal in type 2 diabetes. We just had a woman in our clinic the other day who's been on insulin for 20 years who got off insulin in three weeks by cutting out all the crap. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> it's powerful, yeah. So yeah. I think uh, maybe I would leave with the thought that Michael Pollan, our friend, said, which is if it was grown on a plant, eat it. <laughs> if it was made in a plant, Leave it. And if it's being <laughs> sold in a, in a grocery store, you know, beware. Beware, exactly. <laughs> well, thank you, Michael. This has been fabulous. Great. And thank you all for Very listening. Pleasure. I'm so glad we got a chance to share your story and your enthusiasm about what's really happening. And thank you for your work. It's, it's fabulous. And keep at it. I do my bit. I do my bit. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if anybody loved this podcast, leave a review. Tell us what you thought. Ask questions. And uh, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram and check out my newsletter at drhyman.com and I'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.